Praise the Lord. Oh, all right. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Glad to see everybody here tonight. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and get uh, started with the word of prayer first. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your favor. We thank you, Lord God, for just being who you are in our lives. Father, we ask you today, Lord God, that as we sit here to ponder and study your word, Lord God, that you would uh, open up our eyes of understanding, Lord God, reveal yourself to us in the name of Jesus. Show us, Lord God, who you are through your word in the name of Jesus. Help us to not only hear the word, but to apply it to our lives in the name of Jesus. And Father God will forever give you all the glory and honor and praise. Bless me as I stand here before the people of God. Lord God, I'm asking you today that you will work my mouth, that you would anoint me as I go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, I'm probably, I don't expect to be before you very long tonight. Um, it's probably going to be a short one. <clears throat> Uh, but tonight, um, I, I want to talk about uh, justification. Justification. Um, and my theme scripture tonight, we're going to kind of go around to a couple of scriptures. We're going to be doing a little bit of reading tonight, if that's all right. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 is the uh, theme scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. I'll give you a minute to... Find it, but I'm going to go ahead and read it in your hearing. Again, this is Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 through 9. I believe we will uh, reference this scripture later on in the lesson today. And it says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? That's our theme scripture for tonight. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about this particular topic tonight is because um, it was sort of sparked from a conversation that I had a few weeks back with a friend of mine right out here in this parking lot, actually. We were talking about justification. We were talking about righteousness. We were talking about church culture and the way that we grew up and the things that we were taught in church. And so as we were talking, um, he mentioned something and said something that sparked a thought in me. Um, about what it means to be justified, about what it means to be righteous. Um, there are times when I think that righteousness is like a rite of passage, um, that is, righteousness is sort of like a stage in life that I, I need to arrive at, or it's a pinnacle that I need to reach. Um, once I get to a certain age, maybe then I'll be righteous. Or, or once I reach a certain level in the church, once I get a certain position in the church or a certain title in the church, once I become an elder or once I become a pastor, then I'll really be righteous, all right? But the truth of the matter is righteousness is not a trophy that is to be attained or apprehended, all right? You'll never get to a point in your righteousness where you'll feel like you have arrived, all right? Righteousness is not just about behavior, it's not just about actions. It's not just about what you do. Righteousness is not merit-based. All right? Does everybody understand what that means by merit-based? All right? It's not, uh, it's, based on, it's not based on how well you live or how good you are. That's not what righteousness is based on. The Word tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. I don't care how good of a life you think you've lived. Um, I don't care um, how, how well your lifestyle is. I don't care how many good deeds you've done. You will never do enough good deeds to be righteous. Right. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, no matter how clean we may think our life is, there are areas in our life that are not so spotless. Okay? Righteousness is a state of being. Righteousness is not about what we do, but who we place our faith in. Ah, uh -huh. uh huh. I want you to consider this thought. I want you to think about this for a minute, all right? You didn't do anything to become a sinner, but be born. All right. You can't do anything to become righteous, but be born again. Everybody understand that? Let me say that again. You didn't do anything to become a sinner, but be born. You can't do anything to become righteous, 
but be born again. All right, so let me take it all the way back to the beginning so we can get some context about that. Um, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden through his disobedience, the Bible says that sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for all have sinned, all right? So in the beginning of time, all of us in this room, everybody was in Adam. We were all in Adam. And so when Adam sinned, everybody sinned at the same time. So before you fought, before you fornicated, before you lied, before you cheated, before you deceived, before you stole, before you manipulated, before you gossiped, before you fornicated, before you did any of those actions, you were already labeled a sinner when you came into the world. David said in Psalms 51 and 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, some theologians uh, say that that particular verse is probably uh, referring to, uh, has something to do with uh, his lineage, has something to do with how he got here. Okay? We don't know a whole lot about his mother. We hear a lot about his father, but we don't know about a, a whole lot about what happened with his mother. But there's the idea that uh, he could have been conceived through infidelity. Okay? So there's that. So the theologians, a lot of them uh, attribute that particular verse to maybe David was referencing that. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Okay? But all of us, when we are born, we are shaped in iniquity. Okay? We are born in sin. We come in the world as sinners. All right? It's a state of being for us. We are sinners when we come into the world. All right? So, uh, because you were born in sin, the acts of sin became natural to us. So it was a natural impulse for your flesh to want to curse somebody out. It's a natural impulse for your flesh to want to cheat, for your flesh to want to lie. When you think about it, just think about how kids are, right? You don't have to teach kids how to lie. You don't have to teach kids how to be manipulative. You don't have to teach kids how to uh, be selfish. You do have to teach them how to be kind. You have to teach them how to be loving. You have to teach them how to share because it's natural to us, to our flesh, to do all of the, the, the lying and the cheating and the stealing. That just comes natural to us. We don't even think about it. It just happens. We just do it, right? Because it's just a part of who we are. When we came into this world, we were sinners. That was our being, all right? And not only were we labeled a sinner, but death was passed down to us like a family heirloom. It was an inheritance. It was inherited, we inherited death. We inherited sin, all right? And as a result of inheriting sin and inheriting death, we also inherited violence. We inherited sickness, we inherited disease, we inherited natural disasters. We inherited all of these things from our father, Adam, because we were in him, all right? Is this making sense to everybody so far? All right, so sin, just like righteousness. So just like righteousness is not merit-based, sin is also not merit-based. Sin, being a sinner, you didn't, you didn't merit that. That's just what you were when you came in, all right? And as a result of that being, then you acted on that being, all right? I hope this is making enough, uh, enough sense to everybody, and I hope I'm not going too fast, all right? So, um... In Christ, though, we have a new inheritance. In Christ, we inherit righteousness. In Christ, we inherit healing. In Christ, we inherit peace. In Christ, we inherit joy. All right? That's what we get when we come into Christ. All right? Does that make sense to everybody? So in Adam, we pass from death to death. In Christ, we pass from life to life. So in Adam, if you stay in Adam, if you stay in your flesh and you never get into Christ, then you're going to die in this world and then you're going to die in the next world because that's another form of death, all right? But in Christ, we don't die. There's no such thing as death in Christ. We might go to sleep. But we don't die in Christ because we go from this life to the next life. All right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, 
So the Bible says, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. All right. And just like you were made a sinner because you were in Adam, you were made righteous because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. So now that we are saved, now that we are washed in his blood, now that we are filled with the spirit of God, we are no longer in Adam. But we are in Christ. So the Bible says that we have been imputed with righteousness. Anybody know what that definition imputed means? Anybody want to uh, try it? What does impute mean? No wrong answers. Nobody knows. Nobody has any guesses about what impute means. Nobody wants to try. All right. And to impute means to ascribe. It means to assign something to someone. Okay? To impute means to lay the responsibility for something. Impute means to credit. All right? When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are imputed with his righteousness. Righteousness has been accredited to you. Anybody ever had to do, um, we all been through school, right? Anybody ever had to do, um, um, what am I, oh, God. group projects? Oh, I hate those. What, what'd you say? I don't like them. Why, why, you know, why, why, why you know, like group projects? Because everybody don't do their part. Oh, okay. Everybody don't do their part. Anybody else, anybody else had to be a part of uh, any kind of group projects in school or something like that? Anybody liked group projects? Oh, you did? Okay. Since the Lord, you didn't like school. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't really care for group projects either because a lot of times in group projects, you have one person doing all the work and everybody gets an A. Okay? In the same sense, spiritually, okay, Jesus came down to earth, lived a spotless, blameless life, fulfilled the entire law, and then after he fulfilled the law and lived a spotless life, guess what he did? He gave you the credit for it as if you lived it. That's what it means for him to have imputed righteousness onto you. Okay? That makes sense? So he lived it and gave you the credit for it. He had it and put it on you. Okay? That's what it means to be imputed with righteousness. And we are imputed with righteousness when we apply our faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Isaiah 61 and 10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, all right? When you gave your life over to the Lord, he exchanged coats with you. Essentially, he said, I'm going to take your unrighteousness and I'm gonna put that on me and I'm gonna give you my righteousness. So let's exchange. Whereas Adam, he just passed it down. Whatever he had on him, he passed it down to you. But we inherited righteousness through our faith in Jesus Christ. He made an exchange. He said, I'll take your stuff and I'll give you my stuff. All right. That's what he did. OK. Uh, when the prodigal son, the prodigal son had lived a life of sin in debauchery, he had spent all that he had. He was out there living a riotous life, doing whatever he wanted to do, uh, sleeping around with whoever he wanted to sleep around with, spending all his money. And then he got to a point where he got really low in his life. He got to a low point in his life when he decided to return back to his father. First of all, what, what was his father's response? His father didn't say, well, what are you doing back here? You've been out there living your life. Why don't you go back on out there? No, he didn't say any of that stuff. The father, who is a picture of Jesus Christ, held out his hands for his son and accepted him as he was. And what did the father say? He said, he said put uh, the finest robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. For the son that I thought I had lost has now returned back to the house. Now, wait a minute. When his son came back, he, he wasn't clean. He was nasty. He was dirty. He smelled like a hog pen. His hair was messy. He had dirt probably all over his face, all in his cuticles and on his feet. His clothes were tattered. But the father says, put the finest 
cloak on him now. He didn't say, go take a shower first. He didn't say, go clean, it, go, go clean yourself up first. Go wash all that dirt off and go get your hair cut and all of that. Go do all that first. Then I'll put the cloak on you. No, he said, put it on him right now with his dirty self. Y'all don't, don't understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, huh? With his dirty self, the way he is right now, put that cloak on him. The finest cloak. Not some old cloak. Not some old looking tattered stuff. The finest cloak. The most expensive sandals. The most expensive ring. Put that on him right now. So in the same sense, God doesn't wait for you to get clean to declare you righteous. Right. The minute you put your faith and apply your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have become righteous. Not because of your own doing, not because of your actions, not because your lifestyle was good, but because of his righteousness. I'm so glad I serve a God. I don't know about y'all. I serve a God who doesn't wait for me to get clean for me to come to him. He accepts me where I am as I am. Now, now the saints, you know, we're, we're, we're a little different. You know, you, you, got, you got a lot of, you know, prerequisites and stuff like that. You got to do this before you come in here. You got to change this up. You got to turn that around. You got to do this. And that. But that's not what God wow. requires. All he requires is for you to come. Amen. Not for you to fix your life. Not for you to get yourself together, clean yourself up. Because a lot of people believe that. Oh, I can't come to church because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not clean. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not right with God. I don't have all of my T's crossed and all my I's dotted. I, I still got this to put together and I still got that to fix. But you have to realize that you cannot fix yourself. You don't have the power to do that. You need the power of the Holy Ghost to change you. Is it all right if I move over here? Because everybody seems over here. All right, that's better. Amen. It's probably a weird angle though, huh? Is that okay? All right. I just want to make sure I'm talking directly to y'all. All right. So just like the prodigal son, he imputes his righteousness onto us, doesn't wait for us to get our stuff together. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? Christ died for the ungodly. Okay. He didn't wait until we were worthy. He didn't wait until we got ourselves together to die for our sins and shed his blood for us. All right. I want to talk a little bit about Abraham. We're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter number four, and we're going to stay there for a little while tonight, and that's probably where I'll end uh, the Bible lesson tonight. I don't want to uh, do too much rushing through the Bible lesson. Uh, okay, the book of Romans in the New Testament, chapter number four, I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to find it. Romans chapter number four, we're going to read verses one through three. And then we're going to skip around a little bit and read verses 9 through about 16. So a little bit of reading tonight, if you don't mind. Romans chapter number 4, verses 1 through 3. Let me give you just a little bit of background about, about what this chapter is about, what Paul is writing about. He's talking about Abraham. We all know who Abraham is, right? Abraham is a revered figure in the Christian, Islamic, and Jewish faiths. All right, not just the Christian faith, but he's a revered figure in Islam as well as in the Jewish faith. Okay, he is considered the father or the progenitor of the Jewish faith. He is the first of the Hebrew patriarchs. God called Abraham from his country, from his family, and from his father's house to a land that he would show him. Abraham, which we don't really talk about often, was a Gentile. All right. What is a Gentile? A Gentile is somebody who is not a Jew. So all of us are Gentiles. Unless there's, there's anybody in here with, with Jewish heritage and blood. I don't know. Anybody a Jew in here? No? Okay. So you're a Gentile, right? Abraham was a Gentile. God decided, decided to start the Jewish faith through a Gentile. All right. I'm saying this on purpose so I can make a point later on. All right. Um, so to build the Jewish Israelite nation, God chose an individual from an idolatrous background. We know that his father was idolatrous, right? They came from an idolatrous place and they served idols. They served every, every idol except for Jehovah God. All right. So um, it doesn't necessarily. Abraham came from that kind of background. I don't know if he participated in the idol, in the idol worship. 
but he came from that family, he came from that background, and God calls him out of that into something else, into something new, all right? Let's read verse number one of uh, Romans chapter number four. Verse number one and two, it says this, what shall we then say, or what shall, we, let's all read it together. What does it say? What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. Verse two. For if Abraham justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. Okay, we're going to stop right there, okay? So, um, Abraham was declared righteous not because of his lifestyle, but because of his faith. If Abraham had been justified because of his lifestyle or because of his good deeds, that would have given him a license to boast in himself and in his accomplishments. All right. We just read the theme scripture, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. So if, 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 if uh, the gift of righteousness and the gift of salvation were given by merit, then that would give us all a license to boast. Or I'm saved because I give to the poor every day. Or I'm saved, I'm righteous because I pay my tithes. Or I'm saved, I'm righteous because I go to church weekly and I'm, I'm, I'm a regular at church. You're not saved or righteous because of any of those things. You're saved and righteous because of Jesus Christ, because of what he did for you in your place. All right. So um, so that we don't have an opportunity to boast salvation and righteousness is attained through faith in Jesus Christ alone. All right. Let's read verses three. Uh, verse number three. And then we're going to skip to nine and ten. But verse number three right now. What does it say? Well, what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham's belief in God through his obedience to his word was counted as righteousness. All right? He was counted righteous before he was circumcised. So before any before his skin was cut, before any blood was shed, he was already counted righteous. He was counted righteous before the law was given. Remember the law wouldn't be given until many 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 years later with Moses. So before circumcision, before the law came, he was counted righteous. Why? Because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Let's read, uh, let's get down to verse 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. What does that say? Cometh his blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 10. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision, or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And we know that circumcision and uncircumcision, well, when they're talking about circumcision, they're talking about the Israelites, talking about the Jews, right? Those are of the Jewish faith. And when we're talking about the uncircumcised, you're talking about the Gentiles. Those are outside of the of a covenant, all right? Outside of the, of the covenant of Israel. And so Paul is trying to illustrate something right here to his audience. He's trying to say, listen, the father of our faith was a Gentile, okay? And he was justified through his faith and not his works. He was justified not because he was circumcised, not because he obeyed the law, but through his obedience to the word of God, he was justified. Because he said, I'm going to believe in God, he was justified simply because of his belief, all right? Because there were some Jews at that time, a lot of Gentiles were getting saved. A lot of Gentiles were getting the Holy Ghost. And so a lot of Jews felt like, well, you know, you, you need to do what we did. You, you, you can't be saved. You, you need to do what we did. You need to obey the law. You need to uh, uh, adhere to the rites of circumcision. You need to do this. You need to do that, this, that, and the other in order to be saved. But Paul is trying to illustrate to them that's not necessary because you're only saved through faith. All right? Let's uh, read verses 11 through um, 16. So let me stop you right there. So circumcision, circumcision does not justify you. Circumcision is just a sign of the justification that you received. 
All right? Let's continue reading. So it says, righteousness of faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. What does the rest of it say? That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they may be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Good. Let's, let's go to uh, verse number 12. To the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet uncircumcised. Verse number 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. 15. Because the law of the Lord had wept, for where no law is, there is no transgression. 16. Therefore it is faith. That it might be by grace to the end of promise, might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Who is the father of us all? So Abraham is not just the father of the Jews, he's the father of everybody who is in Christ. All right? So God had a plan from the beginning of time to include the Gentiles into the plan of salvation, all right? Even though it was first presented to the Jews, right? To the Jew first and then to the Greek and then to the Gentile, all right? But he had a plan in his mind all along to include us into the plan of salvation. And that is evidenced through his calling of Abraham, who was a Gentile, all right? So he brought Abraham and started the faith through him and so now everybody who applies their faith in Jesus Christ can inherit the blessing of Abraham. So what was the blessing of Abraham? He said, I was going to uh, uh, bless you. Uh, and you're going to be a blessing. And uh, I'm going to curse those that curse you. All that whole thing that he, he told to Abraham, that applies to him and all of his descendants. Now, none of us in here are Jews by blood or by nature. But we are Jews by faith. And through the blood of Jesus Christ. All right? Spiritually, you are a Jew. And so because I am a spiritual Jew, guess what? I get everything the Jews get. I inherit everything the Jews get. So I'm blessed in the city. And I'm blessed in the field. And I'm blessed going out. And I'm blessed coming in. And I'm blessed to be a blessing. All right? I get all of that stuff that the Jews inherit because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. All right, so um, let's move on to uh, Luke chapter number 18. In the New Testament, I'm almost finished. I'm just about finished. Luke chapter number 18. Verses 9 through 14. Everybody there? Amen. Okay, let's all read that together. What does verse number 9 say? And he spake this parable. Certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Ten. Two men went up into the temple to pray. All right, so we all know what a Pharisee is, right? A Pharisee is one of the religious leaders of the day. All right, say it, say it again. What you say? No, we can say it. Okay, okay. So he's one of the religious leaders of the day. Everybody, everybody know what a publican was. What is a publican? Tax collector. Tax collector. There we go. And publicans during that time were looked down upon. All right, they were despised. And a, a lot of people thought they were swindlers and just stealing money and, and, you know, taking people's money and all of that. All right. So they were sort of like the outcasts of society and still kind of a little bit to this day. You know, the, the, we don't really we don't really have, have a fondness for, for the tax collectors, you know, for people who work with taxes. Right. We're, we're still kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. right, 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 right. So um, let's move on to verse number um uh, 11. Let's read verse number 11. What does it say? God, I 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as Okay, let's stop right there. So we've got the Pharisee praying to God and saying, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men. How many of us have, in here have been guilty? Let's be honest. How many of us have been guilty of, of praying those kinds of prayers or thinking that way? Right. All of us at some times have been self-righteous at one point in our, in our time. Well, All right. Sometimes we think we're better than people because of the way that we live compared to the way that they live. All right. So he's praying to God, saying, God, I want to thank you that I'm not like this man. Here. Right, right. I want to thank you. I'm not an extortioner. I don't steal nobody's money. I don't do this. I don't do that. I heard somebody say, I heard a preacher say, just because um, you didn't live a certain lifestyle uh, doesn't mean that you need to boast in that lifestyle. You know, well, even if I wasn't saved, I wouldn't be doing that. The reason why you're not doing it is because the grace of God is keeping you from doing it. It ain't got nothing to do with you. It ain't got nothing to do with, with how good you are. The only reason why you're living the way that you're living is because God's grace is covering you and giving you the ability and the power to live the life that you're living. It ain't got nothing to do with you. So we can't be self-righteous. Okay? We can't be judgmental of, of other people. Let's read verse number 12. All right? What does that say? Okay, so now he's starting to talk about his own accomplishments, his own stuff that he did, that he's been doing. I fast, I go to church, I get my tithes, I'm faithful, I'm this and I'm that, and I, and I do this and I do that. What does verse number 13 say? And the publican, the So this publican, he's standing afar off. He doesn't even feel worthy to be in the same proximity as the Pharisee. He doesn't even feel worthy to be in the same space as the Pharisee. Okay? That's how humble he is. He's standing afar off, smoting his chest, saying, God, have mercy upon me. I know what I've done. I know the mistakes that I've made. And I know you are a holy God. And I know sin has no fellowship with you. But just have mercy on me. Just look on my situation. Don't turn your back on me. Don't pass me by. Clean me up, Lord. And we all have to get to a point where we get down and get humble like that before the Lord. Listen, I don't care how many accomplishments I do. I don't care how many sermons I preach. I am never, never, never going to get to a place where I feel like I've apprehended or I've arrived. Okay? And you shouldn't get to that place either. I don't care how many titles you have. I don't care if you get elevated to bishop, I don't care if you get elevated to apostle, potentate, chief priest of the whatever. Wherever you attain in God, you are still in need of his righteousness. Okay? Because I think sometimes, and I'll just talk about me, sometimes you think if you get to a certain place in God, get to a certain title or get to a certain position, oh, oh okay, then I'm real righteous then. I'm real righteous now. So, so I, I, you know, no, 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 it's not about that. It's not about titles. It's not about positions, but it's about being humble before the Lord, being broken before the Lord. The Bible says that a broken and a contrite heart, thou will in no ways despise. He's not going to overlook you if you come to him broken. If you come to him sorrowful, if you come to him contrite, he's going to hear you out. All right. So verse number uh, 14, what does that say? I tell you. So Jesus is saying this man is more justified than the Pharisee. Okay? Because of his brokenness before God. Because he decided to humble himself down. Because he put his faith in Jesus Christ. Alright? The Pharisee was put, in, would put his faith in himself. I, 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 I did this and I did that and I've been doing this and I've been that. So he's put his faith in his own ability. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then that's when he can exalt and elevate you. Yes. All right? So um, that's the story of the Pharisee and the publican. And it's just to teach us that we have to be careful about the way that we uh, treat other people, the way that we think of other people. And then we have got to be careful that we're not self-righteous. we got to be careful that we're not judgmental. We don't know where people are in God. That's right. I, amen? Amen. You, you, we got people from different backgrounds. They, they come from, from different areas, from different places. And we can look at them and judge them and think that 
we would get a sense of where we think we know where they are in God. But no, we don't know that. We don't know their heart. Right, right. All right? They might they may not know everything that you know, but you don't know their heart. They may not have grown up the way that you grew up or grew up in the church that you grew up in, but you do not know where that person is in God. So we have to be careful the way that we talk about them, the way that we look at them, the way that we treat other people. Amen? Amen. Okay. Uh, the final scripture for tonight, I'm not, um, and then I'll be done. I'm going to end this early. Um, Acts chapter number 15. Verses 1 through 12. And then I'll take uh, any questions or comments afterward. Uh, but just give me about another five more minutes. All right. Acts chapter number 15, verses 1 through 12. Everybody there? Yep, All right. Let's read that starting with verse number 1. What does it say? And certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, Jews first, right? Um, then the Holy Ghost started falling on the Gentiles. All right, Gentiles started being infilled with the Holy Ghost as well, and it confused some of the Jews because they thought this was exclusive to them. All right. Well, oh, 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 now the Gentiles are being saved. Now the Gentiles are being uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now they're speaking in tongues. All right. So some of the Jews didn't know how to handle that or, or what to do with that, okay? So um, in this particular chapter and verse, you had certain uh, men who had been converted over to uh, Christianity, who had been converted over to the faith, who were saying, now these Gentiles, um, they need to be circumcised like we were circumcised. They need to do what we, what we did, or, or they're not saved. They need to follow our traditions. They need to adhere to the circumcision. They need to adhere to the law of Moses. They need to do all this stuff that we did in order for them to be saved. Okay? And so here comes Paul and Barnabas. Here they come to address this issue. What's verse number five? Let's read that. Continue reading. Verse number five. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, and that it is needful to circumcise them. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so these were saved Pharisees. Okay, these were Pharisees that had been filled with the Holy Ghost. All right? Verse number six. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Seven. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while God made choice amongst us. That the Gentiles are not to the word of God, but the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the word of the word of God, 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 the word of now, you know the background, and you know the nationality, and you know where they came from, and you know who they are, but you don't know the heart. God is the one who knows the hearts, all right? Giving them also the Holy Ghost, all right? Even as he did unto us. Verse number nine, what does that say? And put no difference between us and them, purifying our hearts by faith. All right, let's stop right there. God put no difference between us and them. We're the ones who put differences between each other, all 
all right? I'm this, I'm that, I'm apostolic, you're a Presbyterian, I'm, I'm Methodist, you're Catholic, I'm this. We're the ones who make those distinctions, all right? Um, but God is no respecter of persons. He will, he'll fill anybody he wants to fill. We don't have a monopoly on the Holy Ghost. Right. We cannot control it. Right. And we right. cannot give it. Right. So right. he will fill whoever he wants to fill. Amen. So he'll fill the Catholic if he wants to. Amen. Yeah, you know, there are some people who are surprised, you know, when certain people get the Holy Ghost, like, what, they speak in tongues? You, you ever seen somebody speaking in tongues? You're like, wait, what? They're from the Baptist church, they're from the Presbyterian church, they're from the Methodist church, they're speaking in tongues, they're baptizing in Jesus' name over there? You'd be surprised right. how many people believe in the baptism of Jesus' name. The name on the church doesn't say apostolic, uh -huh. but they believe like we do. Right. They right. teach like we do. Right. Right. So we can't judge based off of where they came from or what the name of their church is or, or how they grew up. We can't judge off of that, all right? Because God judges the heart. Let's continue reading. Uh, verse number, are we on verse number 10? Yes. yes. Verse number 10. Let's go. Now therefore, why take ye God to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which is neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why are you tempting God to put a yoke on the neck of his disciples? A lot of times we put, we are the ones who put a lot of those extra requirements and stuff on people. Extra prerequisites, extra this and extra that on top of their salvation. Because we feel like they need that stuff to fit in with our religious culture. Verse number 11, what does it say? But we, but we believe, believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Verse number 12. Then all multitude kept silence and gave all the answers to Barnabas and Paul. Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles like him. Yes, there we go. So that was Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 12. That'll be the last scripture that we have for tonight. Um, you know, sometimes when, you're, when you've been in the church for a long time and you've experienced a lot in the church, um, you may not say it out of your mouth, but in your mind, you feel like you've earned that space and that place. And so when somebody new comes in and God starts using them in a certain way, we try to put certain boundaries on them because we feel like you need to go through what I went through. Amen. You need to go through the same process I went through the truth. in order to be where I am. We, we may not say it in those, in those words, but in the way that we treat people, in the way that we act toward other people, sometimes we think that way. Okay? But um, they got saved through grace just like you got saved through grace. Yes. No, and, and, and God, like I said, is no respect of persons. He's not, he doesn't care about where you came from, what your background is, all of that. All right? All right. Uh, I'm taking questions right now. Go ahead. It's not a question, but a statement to what you just said. Um, just because you had to go through it doesn't mean that the other person has to go through it because you may need to go that way in order for you to get where God is trying to take you. Mm -hmm. The other person may not have to do it that way because they are already ready for whatever it is that they, or they have to go a different route. So we gotta be careful not to put what we went through on someone else because one thing we always say, you know, you can't walk in my shoes. We say that a lot, but a lot of times we try to put people in our shoes. Mm -hmm. and, you, and everybody can't handle what you're dealing with. Yeah, I can't handle what you've been through. You can't handle what I've been through. And so we have to stop trying to put people through our stuff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't meant for you to go through what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If God wanted that way, then we would all be robots and doing the same stuff and going through the same thing. But right. that's not how he wanted us to be. Right. right? Even in school, we learn differently. Some people are visual learners. Some people learn by experience. Some people come, are hands-on learners or whatever. So we can't just put what we deal with and what God put on us on everybody else. It don't work like that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I agree with that. I agree. Um, there was a parable, and, and y'all can, I hope I don't mess this parable up, but it just came to mind. Uh, about workers in the field, right? They've been working all day. Right. Toiling all day. Yeah. All right. And here comes the, the last little bit of, of before they get ready to clock out, here comes another group of people coming in. All right. And they, they work the last shift, right? They didn't work as long as the first shift people. All right. But they got the same reward. And so the people who were came in first, like, wait, 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 huh? 
We, we've been here 20, 10 hours. I don't know if it says 10 hours. But we've been here working and toiling. We been, and, and here they come in. They only been here an hour. They get the same pay we get. Yeah. But that's how grace works. Come on, preacher. That's how grace works. There's going to be people coming in. They ain't been in church as long as you have. Right. Ain't been serving in the ministry as long as you have. Oh. But like First Lady Fury said, uh, it took all of that to make you who you are. So you can't compare your experience with somebody else's experience, all right? Um, and you don't know what that individual went through either when they came into the faith. You don't know what they've gone through, what they've experienced while they were out there, all right? Anybody else have any comments or questions before I end tonight? Yes, Stephen Scott. I want to go back to when you started off mm -hmm. about Adam. Yes. And you said that Adam was just one of the first ones nobody was. Adam came here. God didn't have the man in the world. There wasn't no sin in it. There wasn't no sin in the person. But he was one man and God had made him. And God don't make nothing about the person. He made the person mad. Right. And when he made the person mad, and all the way that he did, and he took us out, they talked about the tree, and he sat forward. And it was not to eat of it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't eat of it until he took a bottle from Adam mm -hmm. and made a wolf man. And that's when sin came in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you get it, it that long time, well, you would have been here. You would have been here. And you born and shit because you born by man. Okay. She okay. wasn't born by no man. You were born by a woman. You were born by a woman. Some returning. I appreciate that illustration because the first thing that came to my mind was that our righteousness is filthy rags, you know, and that how the Lord brought us in. Uh, I wanted to comment on, on the fact of how, you know, it's so important how we don't look at others as we're more righteous than them, you know, mm -hmm. but we show that love. And, uh, you know, I saw a beautiful real example of that on, on Saturday at the Brotherhood Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And this brother had come in, and we didn't really know his his background um, per se, or what church he goes to. Uh, but all the brothers just really just showed so much love to him on Saturday, and uh, man, he was just he was really eating it up, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna be back." And you know, you just saw it like it was like almost if he had been part of our fellowship for like, like years, but it was his it was his first time really being there. Yeah. I just yeah. thought that was a beautiful display, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're talking about the brother who was uh, starting off Muslim, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He had a powerful testimony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was Muslim for 37 years. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. And God just converted and turned his whole life around yeah. after 37 years of being a Muslim. Yes, sir. And, and looking at him, I wouldn't have known that he was used to be a Muslim. Right. I, I didn't know his, his background just looking at him. That, that goes to tell you, you don't know where people come from. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they've endured. You don't know what they came out of. So we got to be careful the way that we look at other people. Yes, sir. Yeah. To, to what Brother Gabriel was saying, one of my devotionals today was talking about that, how her and her husband had went to um, a bar um, that was out nowhere, whatever, they went into this bar. But she said everyone in the bar knew that they were not from around there and they sat there just to get a meal but she said as they sat down every time and once they sat down a, a different couple would come 
and sit with them at the table, introduce themselves and say, you know, hey, I'm this, this, that, whatever. They would get up, another couple would come, sit at the table, introduce themselves and say, hey, hey. By the time they left the bar, they knew everybody in the bar, knew all about their information, all about them, whatever was going on and left. And she said, we don't feel like this at church. Mm, 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 mm. Wow. And I just was like, wow. You could go to somewhere that we label as not a good place, but they were more friendly to her and her husband than coming to the church. She said, I've been, and her and her husband are pastors and wives, and she said, I've been to many churches and come to the, sit in the church and nobody comes in to say anything. Wow. Nobody greets me. Nobody says, how you doing? Nobody says anything. And so it was just like, wow, that's a really good uh, illustration of how we have to do better with loving on people. Right. And showing compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to point out, you know, that when you were talking about uh, Peter, when he had to tell him, you know, that was this same Peter that he had to tell him, hey, wait a minute. Don't 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 put no difference in between them. But then if you go over in in, in, in Galatians, you'll see it was that same Peter that Paul had to check. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying how we have that stigma, yeah. we can just be we could, you know. Say one thing, but all in the back of my mind, when he got around his folks, he started out the funny style, if you will. You know what I'm saying? And then Paul had to come and check in. Mm -hmm. So we, like, you know, I get what you're saying. Sometimes we, we don't have to always say it, but we can be thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really got to be careful of, how we, you know, because, hey, and, you know, Peter knew better, but at the same time, he got him with his, you know, and then he started doing that. So, but it's good that you got somebody that can check about that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, that's Anybody else have any comments or questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed Bible study tonight. God bless you all. Good job.